Well, Dr. Watson, you've called this adventure with Mr. Holmes the case of the well-advertised murder, but who on earth would want to advertise a murder? Ah, Mr. Harris, the medium of advertising was not quite what one might expect. It was 1902. We medical men were just breaking fresh ground on the problem of mental disorder. It was late afternoon at the office of Dr. John Kemmel. The doctor's nurse, Patricia, was announcing a patient. Uh, Mrs. Richard Blakely to see you, Doctor. I filled out a card for her. Oh, do bring her in, Patricia. Yes, Doctor. Uh, this way, please, Mrs. Blakely. Thank you. Oh, sit down, Mrs. Blakely. That's it. Now, what seems to be disturbing you? Doctor, I realize that medical ethics require the presence of your nurse, but... This is so confidential. Might we be alone? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. The nurse must remain. Patricia's a very understanding girl, Mrs. Blakely. Dr. Campbell and I have worked together for many years, ma'am, on every conceivable type of case, so you needn't feel embarrassed. Go on, Mrs. Blakely. Well, I haven't an ordinary illness. I have an illness, I, I should say, of the mind. I... Oh, Doctor, I just... I haven't got the courage to speak of this, to face it. Well, won't you try? I can't help you if you won't try, Mrs. Blakely. Very well, I, I'll try. I'm Mrs. Richard Blakely. Notes, Patricia. Yes, Doctor. My marriage to Richard was a marriage of impulse. I, I became infatuated with him. Richard was handsome and well-bred and gallant. He was my lock in var, come out of the West. Of course, after a few years of marriage, the first ecstasy died. The inevitable erosion of time began. Our marriage assumed the standard pattern of inertia, and I grew bored. And then I grew to dislike Richard. Doctor, I can't bring myself to say this. Now, please try, Mrs. Blakely. I'm sure you can. I disliked Richard in a petty way. It was a desire to avoid him more than anything else. He traveled because of business. I'd hoped he'd be delayed, giving me more time without him. I began filling the house with guests so that we shouldn't be alone. How did your husband react to this? Oh, he became irritated. Richard is jealous and possessive. He wants to be with me constantly. Then I thought of a divorce. Uh-huh. And uh, what did you decide? Oh, it would be hopeless. He'd never grant one. Besides, even if I succeeded, he'd follow me and haunt me and use every device imaginable to bring me back. Now, why have you come to see a physician? Well... I began reading about the new theories of that doctor in Vienna, Sigmund Freud. Ah, yes, an astounding development. Brilliant craftsman of the human psyche. I became obsessed with what sort of demons might be lurking in my own unconscious. <laughs> you shouldn't be alarmed, Mrs. Blakely. Each of us has skeletons in the closet whose rattling is sometimes terrifying. Well, perhaps you can dismiss it, doctor, but I can't. I've made a horrible discovery about myself. What is it, Mrs. Blakely? I want to kill my husband. Really? That's why I've come to you. I'm afraid of going out of my mind. I've read every word of Freud. I have the symptoms. I have constant headaches and pressure at the back of my head and sudden palpitations of the heart. I, I can't sleep and my hands tremble. They're abnormally cold... And I find myself exhausted suddenly for no apparent reason. You haven't been exerting yourself physically? No. Can I prepare for a physical examination, Doctor? In a moment, Patricia. Mrs. Blakely, this desire to murder your husband, tell me more about it, can you? Well, in the morning, when he's having his breakfast coffee, I, I think how easily I might poison the cup. And when we're in the underground, I think how simple it would be to push him before the train and say it was an accident. I'm on the road to insanity, Doctor. There's no doubt of it. And always, after I think of murdering Richard, I have spells. Breathing, breathing is difficult for me. I feel faint. Oh, easy, Mrs. Blakely, easy. There must be something you can do. I, I, I mustn't go through with this awful thing. Roll my Patricia in hot water immediately. Yes, Doctor. Mrs. Blakely, have you told your husband of this? Oh, no. He'd ridicule me. I couldn't tolerate that. I'm losing my sanity, Doctor. I shall be a hideous, gibbering creature tied to a bedpost in Coney Hatch or Bedlam. Mrs. Blakely, 
We medical men still have pitiable spears with which to fight the dragon of insanity. But I shall try. I shall do everything possible to help you. I've had even more ghastly thoughts, Dr. Campbell. I've thought killing him just once wouldn't satisfy me. I've had a lust to take a knife and plunge it into his body over and over and over. <laughs> Mrs. Blakely home, Dr. Campbell? Yes, Mr. Holmes. I administered a bromide and told her to go home and rest. I didn't want to strain her any further today. Very advisable indeed. She had no idea you were coming to see me. Oh, no, none whatsoever. I'm shocked you should think I would tell her, Mrs. Hall. The, the, the woman is infinitely ashamed of this fear that possesses her. And immediately after you packed her off, you came here to Baker Street? Well, I made just one stop to see a patient at Upper Gloucester Place. I have a confession, Mr. Holmes. Oh? I've come to tell you about this case as fast as I could because, well, because the great psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud of Vienna, is attracting a great deal of attention. But we doctors are still quite helpless in the face of mental aberration. You agree, Dr. Watson? Unquestionably. You see, Freud has opened a door for our profession, but we've years of research ahead. I thought you might advise me, Mr. Holmes. It, it's so dangerous a situation. Yes. Dr. Campbell, are you at all familiar with Mrs. Blakely's home? Her family, her husband, perhaps. Oh, no, no. This afternoon was the first time I'd ever seen or heard of Christine Blakely. Oh, tragic figure, that woman. I wouldn't admit it to her, but I do believe she's on the verge of losing her mind. And of murdering her husband. You've been shockingly careless, Doctor. Fetch your things, Watson. I've what? Uh, where are we off to her? Mrs. Blakely's house. Immediately. Well, I, I wouldn't disturb her now, Mr. Holmes. She's so distracted. Now, perhaps tomorrow... No, we... we must see her tonight. She must be removed from the house before she has further opportunities for murdering Richard Blakely. As a matter of fact, we've lost precious time already. Where is Mrs. Blakely's residence, Dr. Campbell? Across Regent's Park, St. James Terrace. We'll fetch a carriage and hurry over. Well, the quickest way is by Park Road, past Hanover Gate. Right you are, Dr. Watson. Uh, I'm ready, Holmes. Then quickly, gentlemen, quickly. <laughs> Where were you this afternoon, Christine? Richard, if you're going to assume that impossible role of prosecuting attorney again, I... Where were you? Shopping. You're lying. I was shopping. Now, will you finish your dinner? The roast will be cold. Tell me the truth. If you don't stop persecuting me... Were you me, with a man? Richard. Christine, I know you so well. You're the cool, statuesque mistress of the household. But in your heart of hearts, you're a cheap, scheming little... You... Foul mouth! Does it please you to slap my face? Does it add to your feeling of superiority? If you tell Christine, I know what you really are. Well, then why don't you do what any man with pride would do and get out? Or let me get out? No. You're going to stay here. You're going to go on living with me. I'd never let you wander off. You're the prisoner of St. James Terrace. It's humiliating and unbearable to you, and that is just what I want. It delights me to have this tigress caged and restless in my home. Richard, this endless battling is so absurd. Can't we stop it? We're so weak. Perhaps we should go away together to some spot we knew when we first met. Do you think so? Now, I'm never sure whether you're being sincere or if you're just play-acting to amuse yourself. No, not play-acting. Oh, let's talk sensibly. Oh, sit back and relax and enjoy your dinner, and then we'll stroll in the park and we'll talk. Good, sensible talk. All right, Christine. I'll try it. That's better. Now, let me cut a fresh piece of that roast for you. Hand me the carving knife, will you? By Jove, Holmes, there's Park Road. Uh, look, it's blocked. Quite so, Watson. It's being repaired. You see the sign? It's blocked as far as Hanover Gate. We shall have to turn about, Mr. Holmes. We'll have to take Marathon Road to York Gate and cross the park on the outer circle. Yes, Dr. Campbell. 
Turn around, driver. Make for Marabone Road. Hurry. Uh, it'll cost us quite a bit of time, confound it. Yes, and meanwhile, Christine Blakely is alone with her husband. And he has the remotest notion that she means to kill him at any moment. <laughs> There you are, Richard. I've cut a very tempting piece of the roast for you. You can be considerate, Christine. And I do appreciate the rare moments when you are. You put down the carving knife, you'll cut yourself. I've given a great deal of thought to us, Richard. Of course. I've made a decision. You have, Christine? What is it? What is it, Christine? I can only be happy... Yes? I can only be happy if... If what? If you're dead. If you're dead! If you're dead! If you're dead! I feel much better now, Richard. I feel much better now. Blakely, wait. Good Lord. We're too late, Dr. Campbell. Holmes, don't tell me the... Oh. Mrs. Blakely. Who are you? I'm Dr. Campbell. You must recognize me. You visited my office late this afternoon. Apparently, she's lost all sense of orientation. Mrs. Blakely, you do know who I am, do you not? I've never seen you before. I've never seen any of you before. I know who the gentleman is lying on the floor, though. That's my husband. He's dead. I killed him. With this knife. The knife is still in my hand, dripping his blood. That's the way I wanted it. I feel much better now. I'm afraid she's gone mad, Mr. Holmes. I'll fetch her thing. I must send her over to the police immediately. Or her coat. It's in this cupboard. You hope the police won't detain her for long? Miserable creature. She should be turned over to a mental hospital. Now, come, Mrs. Blakely. You must come with us. I must come with you? Yes. Uh, you see, we must notify the authorities. And... Holmes, what are you doing with the body? Examining it, Watson, obviously. Yes, well, the police will tend to that. They tend to all the details. There's one detail that may escape them, my dear Watson. One amazing, bloody detail. <laughs> Look, Mr. Barons, let's hold that detail a minute. I'd like to talk to you some more. About Clippercraft clothes? Why, say, you've already sold me. But did I tell you about the You mean how that... over 1,200 fine independent stores from coast to coast gang up their buying power? Yes, and... and combine on manufacturing and distribution so that they can give values that are simply fabulous. Sure, I know. That's why Clippercraft top coats and overcoats look so expensive. But actually, Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only cost 40 to 47.50. Oh, I was coming to that. They're a terrific buy. Zipper lining top coats and those smart clipper craft overcoats. You've really got to see them to believe they're only forty to forty seven fifty. That's why men who know insist on clipper craft clothes. So be sure to visit the clipper craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to clipper craft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at Eighth and Sixty Seven Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Well, Dr. Watson, we're, we're terribly anxious to learn what the astonishing detail was that Mr. Holmes thought might escape the police. Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Harris. Well, sir, Holmes, as usual, refused to elaborate at that point. We notified the police. They removed Richard Blakely's body. Mrs. Blakely, now clearly deranged, was conducted to a prison cell. There was a careful investigation. Finally, she was committed to Bedlam, that awful asylum for the insane in Kent. You know, I'd regarded the case as a simple tragedy that had moved to its inevitable end, but not Holmes. He paid a visit to Mrs. Blakely in her room at Bedlam. 
Although we've met Mrs. Blakely, you won't recognize me. I am Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Yes, they mentioned your name to me. I don't seem to recall what your profession was, Mr. Holmes. I frankly don't recall who you are other than the name. Mine is the profession of criminal detection, Mrs. Blakely. You're with the police? Not at all. I function entirely upon my own. I have no official position, no staff. I've no weapons other than my brain. A more than satisfactory arsenal, I find. And is there something I can do for you, Mr. Holmes? I have an insatiate curiosity, Mrs. Blakely. I wanted to inquire further about your husband's death. Well, really, unless this is absolutely necessary... I merely wanted to ask if you could recall the exact sequence of events beginning with the moment when you returned to your home after leaving Dr. Campbell's office. Oh, please don't ask me to do that. I'll become ill again. Why do you ask that question? Simply my own desire to understand every crime in which I'm involved. The last minute design of a grotesque pattern. Well, I really don't remember much. When I came home, all sorts of thoughts ran through my mind. My visit to Dr. Campbell that afternoon, the fact that he was on the way with you but that I could defeat everyone by killing Richard then and there. Oh, please. Unless it's most urgent, I, I can't reenact that awful night. I just can't. Very well, Mrs. Blakely. I regret disturbing you. I thought they were finished with me. I thought they'd allow me to rest. You're like desert birds picking ghoulishly at the dead. It's over, and it'd best be forgotten. Had it... Mrs. Blakely? Oh, I'm pleased that you dropped by to my office, Mr. Holmes. Are you, Dr. Campbell? Yes, I was afraid that after the Blakely case had ended, our acquaintance might end with it. I hardly thought so, Doctor. Oh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Is there some matter on which I may be of assistance, or is this just a social call? I do not pay social calls, Doctor. My time is much too valuable to be dissipated upon the amenities of more conventional men. Then what is wrong, Mr. Holmes? I've just come from a visit to Mrs. Blakely at the hospital. Oh, how is she? Just as sane as ever. I don't quite know what you mean. Mrs. Blakely is just as sane as ever. She never was insane, Doctor. Oh, that's fantastic. I refuse to believe it, sir. Mrs. Blakely has been presenting the world with a melodramatic performance simulating insanity. A performance that proved most convincing to everyone. Except to me. If you're talking nonsense, Mr. Holmes, I'm a physician. Or you must recognize my ability to judge the symptoms of my patients. Christine Blakely intended for a long time to do away with her husband. The sudden popularity of Dr. Freud in Vienna gave her just the situation she desired. Well, what situation? She required a technique for avoiding the penalties of homicide so that she might be rid of her husband, so that she might ultimately join the man with whom she was secretly in love. The man with whom she was secretly in love? Oh, did I neglect to mention that before, Doctor? You're the man, Doctor. You plotted with Christine and helped her to commit the murder. I warned Christine time and again that you should be our sole concern, Mr. Holmes. She insisted, though. She wanted her insanity well established with someone of unquestionable repute. So I went to you. I've been prepared for you, though. With that revolver? Oh, the revolver is merely to detain you, Mr. Holmes. I shan't kill you that way. You shall have a most regrettable heart attack while paying me this visit. You came to consult with me about chest pains. Then you died. Hmm. Interesting plan. Of course, consulting you on medical matters would be foolish. I've looked into your background, sir, and it seems you have no legal right to practice. Your title of doctor is pretense. You never earned it. I've been well prepared for your accusations, Mr. Holmes. Look in this drawer. This hypodermic contains a drug, an overdose. I shall inject it into your arm. The needle prick is almost invisible. The injection will strain your heart to the bursting point. Most unfortunate. Now, you were saying about Christine. Oh, yes. She has been conducting a clandestine affair with you. 
Her late husband traveled on business. You imparted that information to me yourself. While he was away, you visited the Blakesley home. You found evidence to that? I never indulge in idle conjecture. Of course I have evidence. You and Christine concocted what you believed to was an ingenious idea. You would establish that she was losing her mind. She would publicize the murder in advance. Your nurse was most important. My nurse? Yes. You insisted she remain and hear every word of Mrs. Blakely's. She was an indispensable witness. Mrs. Blakely would then kill her husband, plead insanity, be committed to a hospital rather than to the gallows, and within a short time she'd be cured, released, and would join you. That was the plan, yes. But you made your first error, Doctor, when you mentioned that you stopped to see a patient at Upper Gloucester Place. That is on Park Road. You couldn't have avoided noticing the road was blocked. Yet, when Watson suggested we dash to the Blakely's via Park Road, you accepted the suggestion. Why, Doctor? Because you were afraid Christine wouldn't have time to kill Richard before he arrived. You wanted the delay at the blocked road. Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Surprising powers of observation. When we arrived and found Christine with the body of her husband, you said you'd fetch Mrs. Blakely's things. You knew where they were. You knew the clothes cupboard she used, although you were never supposed to have been to the house before. I was so right in warning, Christine. Now I shall inject this hypodermic. If you resist, I shall be forced to shoot. I'd rather not do that. Naturally. When I examined the body, sir, I mentioned finding an amazing detail. It was the fact that Christine had killed her husband with surgical precision. It's very difficult to plunge a knife into someone's heart directly without the blades being deflected by the ribs or the chest wall. But hers was masterly strokes. It required some knowledge of anatomy to place the knife so neatly into the center of a heart. It confirmed my previous suspicion. Christine had been coached by someone rather learned in such matters. By you, Dr. Campbell, by you. May I ask, Mr. Holmes, why you allowed the investigation to proceed? Because although the evidence was heavily weighted against you, I do not make accusations unless I am upon extremely firm ground. So I waited to visit Mrs. Blakely, and she provided me with a final bit of information that I needed. Did she? Yes. You told me Mrs. Blakely had no idea that you'd come to see me about her case. You were appalled at my question. But, sir, just a few minutes ago, Mrs. Blakely inadvertently mentioned that the night she killed her husband, she sat in the dining room thinking of the fact that you were on your way with me. Again, undeniable proof that this homicide was carefully prearranged. She knew exactly what you were doing. A superb series of deductions, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Now we shall have our unavoidable disaster, your heart attack. Roll up your sleeve, Mr. Holmes. You're forcing me to remind you that at this range, if I pull the trigger of this gun, it'll blow your head off. I have the needle ready. I said roll up your sleeve, Mr. Holmes. I assure you, your death from the drug in this hypodermic will neither be long nor painful. I'm quite familiar with the effects, Doctor. Then you must know you will experience a sudden shooting pain. Very short life. And then oblivion. Rather a pleasant way to die, I should say. Roll up your sleeve. That's it. Now raise your arm. Raise your arm. I'll just take this needle this way. Find a vein. Clench your fist, Mr. Holmes. Good. Good. Now the needle so. Drop that needle, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Watson! Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard is with me, Doctor. I'll take that gun, Dr. Campbell. <sighs> I began to believe you'd never step inside, Watson. Campbell, give your gun to Inspector Lestrade. Come on. Come on! No! No! Oh, ah! oh my hand! I'll ah. take that gun. There we are. I took the precaution, Dr. Campbell, of posting Watson and Lestrade just outside your door. Did you overhear every word, Lestrade? Every word, Holmes. I'll have plenty to tell him in the courtroom. The police should be very grateful to you, Holmes. Very grateful. As always, Lestrade. As always. The uh, Persian slipper, Watson, my pipe deep tobacco. Oh, here you are, Holmes. <laughs> Nothing quite like the armchair here at Baker Street, eh? 
You know, I, I've seen in the newspapers that Dr. Campbell, Mrs. Blakely will go on trial next week. Both for premeditated murder. Mm, excellent. A full-blown trial with a noose in the offing. None of your gentle medical inquiries into the dark recesses of Christine Blickley's mind. Amazing, Holmes. Amazing. The facility with which you take a seemingly clear-cut case of insanity and prove that it was a scientifically outlined murder. By George, you know, there may have been countless other cases that passed unnoticed. And the, the killer is now scot-free. Uh, conceivable, don't you think, Holmes? Uh. A uh, murder that defies cold logic? It is beyond understanding? I uh, beg to differ, my dear Watson. Any murder that defies explanation just requires time for me to smoke and think. To me, a case that's supposedly beyond human understanding is simply a three-pipe case. Match, please, Watson. <laughs> Dr. Watson, the well-advertised murder deserved the attention it received. It was fascinating. I'm delighted that you enjoyed it, Mr. Harris. And I do believe you'll enjoy the adventure I've planned for next week equally as well. It's an adventure I've called The Island of the Dead. And it concerns the ancestor of one of history's most ruthless pirates. An uncharted, uninhabited island and a ship with a dead pilot at the wheel. <laughs> 